So I was on Jeopardy and then my husband was on the year after. I swear to God, the, the board before mine was like, children's books, Shakespeare, things in the kitchen, things that moms do. And I was like, this is my freaking board. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got up and it was like country music. But there's always a book category and books are my strength. <laughs> and mine, it was books about television shows. <laughs> Books about television shows, that's a television category. <laughs> <laughs>This is Admissible. I'm Natalie Blazer, Dean of Admissions at UVA Law. We are officially in season two of the show, and I'm so excited to bring our listeners even more content that I know is often at the forefront of prospective law students' minds. On today's show, we're talking about judicial clerkships. If you don't know what clerkships are or why you should care about them, don't worry, we're going to cover all of that and then some. Applicants ask me questions about clerkships all the time, so I'm extremely excited to introduce our guest today, who is UVA Law's resident expert when it comes to clerking at the most sought after courts. Senior Director of Judicial Clerkships, Ruth Payne, graduated from Claremont McKenna College before going on to earn her law degree at UVA Law in 2002. While at UVA Law, Ruth was an articles editor for the Virginia Law Review, graduated Order of the Quaff, and was awarded the Shannon Award at graduation. Following graduation from UVA Law, Ruth clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson III on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and completed a one-year Bristow Fellowship with the Office of the Solicitor General of the United States. Ruth returned to UVA Law in 2008 and has been advising our law students on clerkships ever since. Wow. Welcome to the show, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So for season two of Admissible... I have decided I'm going to ask every guest the same sort of icebreaker question, which I ask a lot of people in my just sort of personal life as well, because I find it fascinating. Ruth, what would be your last meal on earth? I love food. So this is a very hard question. <laughs> um, off the top of my head, it would probably involve a lot of dairy, like <laughs> grilled cheese and ice cream <laughs> would be probably right at the top of that list. So I want to start the show with your own journey to and throughout UVA law. Since a lot of our listeners right now, it's January, they're going to be weighing their admissions decisions over the next couple of months. So can you tell us sort of your process, how you decided to attend UVA for law school? Sure. I always like to preface this by saying I'm not sure how instructive it is because unlike many, many of our students who come and do a ton of research and are very well prepared, I did not go into this process very informed. I don't come from a family of lawyers, and I really, I was out working. I didn't come straight through from undergrad, and I basically applied to the handful of schools that my undergraduate faculty mentors, you know, that they went to. They were like, oh, you should apply to, you know, and, and I was very naive. I only applied to four schools initially, um, and then I got a brochure in the mail from UVA, and it looked beautiful, and it had some information about applying for a scholarship which I did, and they offered to bring me out. And and honestly, my thought process was, oh, free trip to Charlottesville. I've never been there. I'd like to see Monticello. <laughs> and I came out to visit, and I just fell in love. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of the faculty. You know, they were just around the weekend that they brought us here, and they were very invested. They really wanted to know what I was interested in. A couple people I, you know, shared an interest in, and they followed up with me and connected me to resources. And it just really made me feel like, wow, this is a place where I'm going to have a great experience. And and that had actually been the first place I'd visited. Um, and then I, I did the circuit of admitted schools for the other four schools. And, um, you know, I didn't fall in love with any of them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like they were all really, I mean, highly ranked schools, um, the ones that you are probably, <laughs> I am not to name, but I was still students, probably the ones that, you know, everybody applies to. And when I went there, I just felt like I would ask students, why did you come here? And they would always say like, well, I came here because it, you know. It's ranked whatever. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. number one school. It's number two school. Yeah. And that didn't feel like a great answer to me. It didn't, it didn't feel like why I wanted to go to law school. Yeah, that's so important. Do you have a favorite memory from when you were in law school? So I was lucky enough to do a clinic my second year in law school. Um, and I should preface this by saying I'd been a social worker before I came to law school. I, I was, didn't come straight through. My background was 
you know, working in the foster care system. And um, I worked on the um, what was then called the Child Advocacy Clinic. Um, and right away, you know, we got there and I, I had no idea what a clinic really did, but we got thrown into court to represent, you know, some some kids. And it was really the first time that I remember thinking, wow, this is I can see what my impact is. Right? This is some place where I can make a difference. Walking in without knowing anything but two pieces of law, you know, I can make a difference in the life of, of these children. Um, and that was very impactful for me. Okay, so let's talk about clerking. First of all, what is a clerkship? What is clerking? So a clerkship is basically a year that you spend as a go-to person for a judge. Um, you spend a year in a judge's chambers which are typically very small. It'll be the judge, maybe they have a judicial assistant, and they'll have somewhere between one and four clerks who do all the work of the judicial system. You know, they usually work on drafting the opinions. They do the research on the law. They sit in on trials. They interface with um, parties if they're at the trial level. And so it's, it's basically just a year in the court where you are the person. Yeah. And so why might a law student or a recent law graduate be interested in pursuing a clerkship as part of their sort of overall path? First and foremost, the work is phenomenal. I talk to our students. I've been lucky enough to be doing this for so long that I have students come back, you know, 10, 15 years later and talk to me, and they'll tell me this was the best year of their career. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to knock other types of work, which are phenomenal, but it's one of the few chances you have that early in your career to get something that substantive. Like you are helping to write the opinions that shape the course of the law. Yeah. Um, and so from just a sort of academic perspective, the work is fantastic. Beyond that, you're working with a judge and people don't become judges early in their career, typically. Right. <laughs> That's a pinnacle job. Um, and so you have these amazing jurists who have seen everything, done everything, often been on the bench for a long time, who are, again, in this very small environment, working with you on your writing. So the ability to just learn things very quickly, how to think about the law, how to write succinctly, that's the reason that, you know, clerkships are valued so highly. And so this is just resume-wise, you know, career impact-wise, everybody loves a clerk. And it's because of that, because the, the training is so intensive and you learn so much that you can't learn someplace else. Do firms still pay clerkship bonuses? They do. And they are substantial. <laughs> they are. When I was practicing at my firm, I remember a friend of mine that I was practicing with went away to clerk for a year. You know, we were junior associates, very junior, like maybe second year. And when he came back and he told me about his clerkship <laughs> bonus, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> but it made sense because of all the knowledge and and experience that he was then bringing to the firm, not to mention a close relationship with a judge, which who doesn't love that? I was shocked. I mean, even 20 years ago when I was leaving my clerkship and fellowship, I had committed to government. That was what I wanted. But there were firms courting me and the bonuses that they were offering were significantly larger than my yearly salary. Yeah, salary. Oh, God. Good for you, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a check on my sanity. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of your own clerkship, I would love to hear a little bit more. I'm sure like listeners are like really want to know what was your own experience like? You know, why did you want to do it? How did you apply? You know, what did you get out of it? What I got out of clerking, I would say the number one thing was the writing experience. The judge that I clerked for is one of the most beautiful writers I've ever met. Just can boil down very difficult topics and make them understandable to the parties who'll be reading them, but also beautiful to read. You can mm. read his opinions like a book. Um, and he really emphasized that, that you are writing for the people and you need to write things that will be understandable. Um, but also he taught us a precision of language. He was very invested in every word counting, um, in there being nothing in the law that should be somewhere accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, and that was such an important lesson to learn early in my career, you know, how every piece matters and how the words matter so much in what you're saying and trying to convey. I remember in legal research and writing that like every word has a purpose. If you find a word that has no purpose, it's got to go. Um, and I, I do want to highlight what you mentioned, you know, just sort of about what clerkships can unlock for you. I mean, 
firms were courting you. You obviously had an amazing government career after your clerkship. Like a lot of future law students um, or or current law students think of clerking as like sort of a, a launch pad for the rest of their career. It's obviously an incredible one year experience in and of itself, but it, it does open doors and it just gives you a great foundation for your career. So now I want to talk about what your office here at UVA Law does specifically for our law students who are interested in clerking at some point in their legal career. So let's say someone has just gotten here. They're a 1L. What does their relationship with your office look like if they're interested in clerking? The Judicial Clerkship Office is part of the career development suite, um, which has these three parts, um, private practice, public service, and then judicial clerkships. Um, And, you know, as an office, we all work together um, because the goal is we want students to get where they want to go. Um, And so we can't do that if we're not all talking about, you know, student desires and their short-term goals and their long-term goals. And so when they come in as 1Ls, they'll initially meet with the office that aligns most closely with their long-term interests, you know, for that first appointment. But after that first appointment, they'll have access to all the offices. And so I will work with 1Ls um, pretty early in the process if they actually want to work for a judge their first summer, um, which is not a clerkship, it's a judicial internship but um, is a great experience, a little bit like a mini clerkship. And then I always tell the students, you know, if you have questions about clerkships, it's early, but stop by. I'm happy to answer them. I really like to get ahead of whatever rumors they're going to be hearing um, (laughs) around the law school about what they can and can't do and what this looks like. Um, We start programming pretty early just to get the basic information out there. But for most students, the clerkship process really, the very earliest we would have kind of a brass tax talk would be their 1L spring. Can you walk us through the steps of, of applying for clerkships within the U.S.? Sure. Um, so honestly, applying for clerkships at its heart doesn't look that different from applying to everything else that you've probably applied to in your life. You're going to prepare a cover letter and a resume and a writing sample that you hope is appealing to the judges. And then in addition, you'll need two or three letters of recommendation, either from faculty members who know you well or prior employers or clinic supervisors, but some number of people who can add some color to your application and and really convince the judge that you are somebody that they would enjoy having in their chambers. The actual how do I prepare my materials part is not that difficult. The complicated part is figuring out what application timeline works for each student because it's not a uniform timeline. Different judges hire on different schedules. Different students have different needs. And I think really, you know, navigating when a clerkship works in your life, whether this is something that you want to do right away or do a few years out, and whether there's other information that you need first and figuring out when are the judges that I think would be a best fit for me? When are they hiring? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I'm doing is helping students navigate that piece of it. Um, Not so much the, can I write a cover letter? Obviously, I I will help them with their cover letters and their resumes (laughs) and interview prep. We do all of that. Um, But the process itself, I think, can be a little overwhelming for students because it looks much less structured than some other job application processes. And and the reason is judges are individuals. They are not organizations. They don't have a recruiting office. Um, They don't have a lot of time in their schedule to be out there hosting receptions. It's just a different world. Um, And so you are dealing with, you know, a lot of individual universes that you have to kind of get your mind around. Are most law students that you're working with aiming to clerk immediately after they graduate or are they securing clerkships for like years down the line? You know, just this week, we see that class of 2021 grad Aaron Brown is clerking for Justice Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. So, you know, that she's been out for two years. So I would love to hear a little bit more about like how far in advance are they doing this now? How does that all work? So the answer to your question Um, of whether students do it right away or 
later on is is both. Um, there are opportunities to clerk at graduation. I think in the traditional model that existed when I was in law school and probably when you were in law school, most students clerked right at graduation. Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. it was a little bit of an apprenticeship model. Um, and that has definitely shifted. Um, we see more judges who are really excited about hiring students who have some experience for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so I would say our students themselves are split. Some are, are very invested in clerking at graduation. Mm-hmm. Um, some think it would be great to get out and get a few years of experience um, you know, behind them before they clerk. And, you know, some number have what they want, and it doesn't necessarily line up with when the judges are hiring in the market they're interested in. Um, And so we'll work with students on what does that look like if you really hope to clerk at graduation, but also you hope to clerk in a big city where most of the judges are actually going to require a few years of work experience. Right, right. How does that work? Are you working with alumni who have been working for a couple years to apply for a clerkship, or are students just applying years in advance and they know they're going to go to a firm for a couple of years. Like, you know, if somebody's not clerking right after graduation, how does that work? Yeah, we see both of those things happen. Um, Some students will apply for clerkships a few years out while they're still in law school because either the market, that's what they're demanding, or because it's what they want. There are some great reasons to clerk a few years out. Um, Some Students really feel like they want to get their feet under them in their legal career. They want to make some money. They have obligations. Some people will do a job that they know they only want to do for a few years, and a clerkship can be a great pivot point. This can be a great way to enter a new market or pivot into public service if they've been in private practice. Some students don't think they want to clerk, and then they get out to their job, and I'll get phone calls that look like, you know— I didn't think I needed to clerk. And now that I'm here with this employer, all of the people I really respect actually clerked. Mm. And I feel like it would be really helpful for me. This is an experience I want to have. How do I get started? I've never done it before. So to answer your immediate question, I absolutely work with our alums. It's probably about half of my caseload. Um, I think that's a pretty unique feature of our law school career office um, is particularly on the clerkship side. I will work with alums no matter where they are in their career. I've had the oldest alum I've ever had come into the clerkship process graduate in the 1970s. Oh, I've had a few from the 1990s. But it's not uncommon for a student who's five or six or seven years out to reach out and, and be looking for help. That's incredible. I had no idea. Can we talk a little bit about jurisdictions for a second? So, like, of course, everyone wants to clerk at the D.C. district or whatever. I mean, D.C., like, Southern District of New York. I'm sure those are always very popular. Eastern District of Virginia, if you're a UVA law student. I'm curious because I think it would be fascinating to just clerk in a completely different part of the country where, you know, you're learning about, I don't know, just things that you haven't been exposed to necessarily. So can you tell us a little bit about just how you help students, like, maybe broaden their horizons when they're thinking about where they want to go, like some pros, cons, things like that? Yeah, I think the pros, cons is is the big piece of that, right? Um, We will typically start with, what is your priority? Mm. Um, Because if they come and say, my priority is I have to clerk at graduation um, because I have family obligations, um, because we're going to buy a house, Mm -hmm. because I'm planning to go someplace for my career where I don't have the option of deferring for a year um, and coming back, then we're going to start with, okay, so who actually might be hiring for at graduation? Um, what I tell students is you can control absolutely one thing <laughs> and then everything else, you know, you have to follow along with what will fit in that in that right. box. Um, and if you're lucky, multiple things that you're looking for will line up. But I think that a lot of our students, just to the nature of of students who come to a top-ranked law school and have for their entire lives had a lot of success and there's always been a brass ring, Mm. they come into law school and want to know what is the best. And I I tell the students at the first session, and they probably hate this, please don't ever say that to me. Um, (laughs) I really don't think that there's a best. So there's a best for you, but, you know, some 
clerkships, I think, are considered to be shinier because there are fewer of them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, of, of course, this is going to be more competitive because there's only, you know, nine judges of this type or 200 judges of this type. That doesn't mean that it's better for your career because actually if what you want to do is, you know, state legal aid, you should be in a state trial court. Mm, yeah. um, and if what you want to do is academia, you maybe want to be in a state Supreme Court. And if you want to try cases, you want to be in a trial court and not an appellate court. And so I like to have them start there with what are you looking to get out of this experience? Um, and then really think about where can I get that? Yeah. Wow. That is so helpful. I don't even think I really thought in my head, broke it down like state level, federal, you know, what and and where you go from there. Um, I think the takeaway is that you can have an incredible experience at all different kinds of courts. Absolutely. And not everyone can clerk on the Supreme Court. I think that's yes. also a major takeaway. <laughs> yes to that. Um, but but kind of speaking of the the prestige element, um, I, I think I'm bearing the lead a little bit here, but I do want to highlight some impressive statistics about our clerkship program. Um, for those of you out there who who don't know, UVA is currently number five in the country in placing clerks on the U.S. Supreme Court. So while not everyone can clerk on the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, UVA law grads are pretty much up there um, in getting those clerkships. We're number four in the country in placing clerks on federal judicial courts. In the 2022 term, UVA law had two clerks on the Supreme Court, 36 on U.S. Courts of Appeal, 52 on U.S. District Courts and other federal courts, and 14 on state courts. And this is now the fourth year in a row that we've had more than 100 alumni clerking. That is unreal. Those numbers are unreal, especially as we've talked about that this is such valuable experience, such you know, a competitive process. Like, obviously, you know, I'm going to say that our students are the best of the best and, and they're impressive in their own right. They're working hard. They're they're going for it when it comes to their career. But, of course, a lot of those numbers reflect, like, everything you're doing and the support and the guidance that they get. And I know that you're, you know, not going to toot your own horn in terms of the judicial clerkship's office. I already know that. But can you just tell us, based on your experience, you've been in the office, you know, almost 15 years now, like, what accounts for our, our like massive success, especially in recent years, in in securing those record numbers of clerkships? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head um, when you said the support we give the program. And there's a few aspects of that. Um, I mean, what I do, sure, but some of it's what the schools allowed me to do. Um, they put their support behind having a full time digital clerkships office. And so I have been doing this for almost 15 years. Um, and it's the only thing I do. Um, this is what I focus on. I eat, sleep and breathe judges. <laughs> um, but, you know, more than that, I think um, the second and probably largest pillar is the faculty support. Our faculty are amazing. They make so many phone calls to judges. They write thousands and thousands of letters. Um, and, you know, as an aside, I feel so much like the work that they do for clerkships is just an extension of the work that they do. Um, the thing that I love the most about the UVA community is how invested our faculty is, how everybody is, our faculty and our administrators in the students. Um, I a little bit thought when I got here, the open doors that I found when I came and visited were, you know, like a good show. And and that wasn't true. Um, they The faculty really is that generous yeah. with their time. Um, and then the third big pillar is our alums. Um, we have such a loyal alumni base. Um, and I mean, just take your breath away, loyal yeah. alumni. And I mean, first off, they go off and like you said, they're fantastic. They do solid work. We have a reputation as a school of producing good clerks, you know, people who work hard, who come in with knowledge, you know, who know the good questions to ask, who are pleasant in chambers. Um, and then beyond that, you know, they're loyal. And so they're trying to pull other, you know, UVA alums in behind them, you know, talking to judges, helping them find good fits for them so that the program just grows on itself. Gosh, I got chills. Our alumni are the best. I'm not just saying that because you and I are both alumni. <laughs> uh, so I think you've shared a lot of actually great advice already, but if someone's out there who's considering 
first of all, they're deciding among law schools, maybe. And and everything that they've heard about clerkships is making them even more excited about, about clerking one day. What advice would you give to someone who's who's about to enter law school and, and who, who really wants to do a clerkship? I, I think, so all of those pieces of advice, the how do you choose your law school and then how do you, um, you know, maximize your chances when you're in law school and what should you be focusing on, um, I just think it's really important. The fit is really important, right? And so this piece where when you're choosing a school, you should be choosing someplace that feels like the place that cares about you as a person, that's going to nurture you, going to help you grow into the lawyer that you want to be. And clerkships is a piece of this, but I I think it really is just a small piece of this, right? I When students tell me I want to come to UVA because of the strength of the clerkship program, I would say, well, thank you. That's very sweet. But also, please don't make that be the thing that you choose on because there's so many amazing things here. And I want to make sure that this is the right fit for you. It's really important. And I get so many questions about how to maximize clerkship chances. But, you know, and this is probably the mom in me. I talk to a lot of judges about the types of candidates they're looking for. And I have 15 years of data about who gets hired. And who gets hired are people who are passionate about something, who come to law school and get involved and develop themselves as good lawyers, not who check boxes, you know, that I have to do certain activities to get to a clerkship. It's I'm developing myself into the lawyer that I want to be. I'm investing in my community. I'm following my passions. And if you do those, the clerkship success will follow. That, I think, echoes a lot of the you know, advice that I I give prospective law students. Like, I'm never going to try to convince somebody to come to UVA Law. You have to feel it, the fit, you know, the visit is so important, all that support, everything we've talked about. Um, I love that. So is there anything about clerkships we did not cover that you really want people to know? (laughs) This is my soapbox piece um, (laughs) because I feel like the hardest part of my job is running up against the things that people hear that are so entrenched in not just UVA law school culture, but just law school culture, um, myths about who can and can't clerk and, um, you know, what you need to be successful. And I really try to get out in front of the students and, you know, as far back as our admitted students as soon as possible to say, there is not a person who can come to UVA law who can't clerk. And so please don't count yourself out because you don't know about clerking or because your grades don't turn out as well as you think they are or, you know, any other reason you don't feel like you have what it takes because we'll help you get there. And and if it's something you want, we'll work with you until you get it. Well, Ruth, thank you so much for being here. This has been a ton of fun and I learned a lot, so I know our listeners are going to benefit immensely from all the information you shared. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This has been Admissible with me, Dean Natalie Blazer, at the University of Virginia School of Law. My guest today was Senior Director of Judicial Clerkships, Ruth Payne. For more information about judicial clerkships at UVA Law, please visit law.virginia.edu and click on the Careers tab. The next episode of Admissible will be out Friday, February 3rd. In the meantime, you can follow the show on Instagram at at Admissible Podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and please remember to rate the show wherever you listen to podcasts.